Hey y'all, Pastor Sam here with your verse of the day for gospel gunslingers. Hey, today we're over in David's Mighty Men, and this is actually going to be our fourth installment on the subject of Joel's army. Really worth looking into. You know, I hope this challenges your eschatology. I hope if you had an escape mentality and didn't ever think you were going to win, that all the promises are off for the buy and by. I hope you're looking at that again because, hey, I would have despaired except I had believed to receive goodness of the Lord, to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, in the land of the living, in the land of the living of the Lord. So goes the song, and thus saith the psalm. Hey, today we're in David's Mighty Men. Uh, I didn't even underline this because this chapter is a gold mine. It's one of the few chapters that's almost parallel. It's a little bit different, but it's repeated in uh, Chronicles also, First Chronicles 11. And we are reading from the uh, 2 Samuel 23 account. So here we go. These are David's mighty men. And uh, let's just read it. Verse 14. And David was then in Anhold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Verse 17, And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. When you get into the further accounts of the mighty men, there were some things that they did in battle that they shouldn't have done. And, you know, it's so easy to just decide not to be a gospel gunslinger. How easy is it to just say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to be a victim and I'm never going to have to make that decision in the moment. I'm never going to have to figure out uh, whether my compadres, whether my uh, fellow soldiers are on the same page. And so I'm just going to I'm just going to lay down the sword and, um, you know, be a victim, be a slave. Pura vida, as the Costa Ricans say, as their state church is the Catholic Church and their nations run by China. Hey, let's not do that. That's not the American way. Let's kick butt. Just once in a while, we have to all get in one accord. We need to be people of prayer. You know, these guys had the power to move in the miraculous in battle. And don't forget, David's mighty men, a lot of them were uh, Goliath's buddies. And then when David went and killed their champion, then they converted. We're going to study this more because they were... Suspect bloodlines of uh, abominable bloodlines of nations that were to be exterminated because of their angelic blood. So these people came along, served David, uh, married, learned about, became proselytes to Israel, uh, became circumcised, as that was part of the proselytizing process. Here's the deal. Every time... You take a bunch of guys out and teach them how to be soldiers. You know, Colonel uh, Robert W. Black, when he writes in his book, A Ranger Born, he tells about being an advisor in Vietnam and how he went out and trained Vietnamese to go fight the Kong, the North Vietnamese and the socialist armies that came down from the north. And the first time he took his team out on patrol, which was after a lot of drill, a lot of practice and arming and such, he said that they sounded like a junkyard sliding downhill. A junkyard sliding downhill. Those are undisciplined troops. This is the way people are their first time into battle. And uh, they call them new guys. Actually, the official military term is FNG. They're not liked. You know, when Grandpa got to England in 1944 with his heavy bomber and his crew, he went and was assigned a rack of somebody that didn't come home the day before. That was everybody's friend, that everybody knew, that all the other pilots knew. They were all buddies. They'd flown together. Here, this guy doesn't come home. And, and who's in that rack? The new guy. The FNG is in that rack. Fortunately, Grandpa was a master bridge player, bid four no trumps, and won that hand. He sat down at the card table, seeing there were three men and they had bridge dealt. He sat down. One of the men said, I don't suppose you know how to play bridge either. Like, dude, you guys can't do anything right. Anyhow, he was a master bridge player. And he sat down, bid four no trumps, and took that hand and won a tiny bit of respect. 
This is the process of becoming battle-hearted and why the Christian thinks that they can escape that, that they're exempt from that, when the whole Bible is about the soldier. The New Testament, okay? Go through Paul's writings. Soldier, be a good soldier. For your fellow soldiers, da 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 Talks about soldiering equipment. Talks about the sword and the, and the spear and all these things. Like, everybody was expected to know that as gentlemen of their day. They were all expected to understand soldiering and swordsmanship. And the fact that some people don't, I wonder how they think they can understand the Bible, which is a book of war stories, which is all about how soldiers conduct themselves. So it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, male or female, it's not too late to learn and to not be that new guy. Colonel Black goes on and tells about how when they would, when they set up their first ambush, it was so simple, it was an L formation ambush, the Kong were coming right down the trail, and of course, of course, there's some guy that can't keep his trigger finger from itching and uh, fires before everybody else. And you gotta wait for him to get in the kill zone. It's basic ambush theory. This is like soldiering 101. You wait for the guys to get in the right place before you start to nail them and everybody shoots at the same time on the commander's signal. Duh! But some guy shot one guy ahead and uh, of course the colonel just raked them all over the coals for that. But they were foreigners and only halfway under his command. And then the story comes out that, oh, that man recognized one of the enemy soldiers that had come into his village and committed atrocities and, I don't know, killed his brother or something. So and the rage rose up in him and he pulled the trigger and screwed up the ambush for everybody. Of course, he got that one guy, but, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a battle lost. It was a battle lost because somebody did not have the nerve to hold because somebody believed in the will of God. They believed in this predestinative business. Actually, Colonel Black actually says in his book, he says, it's very helpful for a soldier if he can convince himself of predestination. That's what the Colonel said. Totally not a preacher. But he found that if soldiers could convince themselves that when their number's up, it's up, that, that's that. It just makes them so much better in battle because then they're cool under fire. Okay, well, I'm not gonna agree with that. I'm gonna say, Make peace with your own will and develop some nerve. And don't screw it up for your whole team by running out at the enemy. You gotta wait until you see the whites of their eyes. This is a very vivid descriptive given by one of our American forefathers. You don't shoot any of those guys until they're close enough that you can see the colored eye and the white part of the eye. You know what? Success, success in battle came from that. Came from holding together and having a good team effort. So these three guys, they went out and they literally fought their way through the whole army, drew some water out of the well, fought their way back through the whole army, gave the water to David. Said, okay, here, here you go, boss. Uh, we, we heard you say you wanted this. Well, that was a heroic act, but David said these men went at the jeopardy of their lives. Let's not convince ourselves of predestination or that the will of God is is that which controls everything, including us. We have to submit our will to his will. We have to get into one accord with one another. It's amazing how many people in America just turn on the TV. It's, a, it's about people's willy doesn't work anymore. And oh, you can take this pill and it'll make it all better. Well, you know what? Maybe if your soul wasn't dead, you wouldn't have issues with that. Maybe you need to go back to basics and learn how to come into accord with another human being male and female, you come into accord, all of a sudden all those involuntary things work that are emotion-based, soul-based. Learn how to be into, in one accord. Learn how to be in one accord. It's a much higher place in God than just performing. And everybody thinks that they want to be a gunslinger. They're just going to take up the sword. They're just going to get themselves a gun and it's not going to transform their lives. They don't, they don't think for they don't count the cost that they're going to have to actually mature and that the stunted emotional growth in their life, whether it's stunted at two years old or six years old or 11 years old. It's a, God, it's amazing to me. People turn 16, they get a driver's license, they're put in charge of this missile, and, and then they go out and they, they kill people every day. They just kill one another. Nobody cares. Buy insurance. What the heck? Oh, we'll all cry. No. It's not an accident. When I was in defensive driving school, the instructor said, an accident is when a meteorite strikes your car. What causes collisions today is errors, and you can cease from making errors. So let's just start right now. That was day one, 
defensive driving. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Graham had earned credit. Crawl out of being that. F N G. So hey, you can do it too. Or you could just go out and be the proverbial shitbird that messes it up for your whole unit. You know, Grandpa's crew was a lead crew. They had to fly in and direct all the other planes into the target area. They had to direct them right to the target. A lot of these, those other planes didn't even have the Norden bomb site. Only lead crews that were known to have nerves of steel carried the Norden bomb site. So Grandpa's crew would go in and boy, when they got near those industrial centers, there was just nothing but cannons on the ground. High explosive shells coming up, fighters coming up, and I mean the flak would just puff all over, puff, 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 all around it. And then they'd come close and they'd shake the plane. It was, sometimes it was just a black cloud going over Berlin or going over Mearsburg of cannon shells that had gone off and planes that had exploded. They had to have nerves of steel to fly straight into that level and straight. And Grandpa actually would take his hands off the yoke and the bombardier would control the plane through the Norden bomb site until he had the crosshairs right on the target. Why don't you endeavor to be that guy? Why don't you endeavor to be that guy instead of the guy that comes into church and says, oh, I shot all over myself all weekend now. I, I, I'm entitled to be loved because that's what this is all about. No, it's about you putting on your big boy pants and your big girl pants and learning how to stand up and be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Let him that stole steel no more, but work that he'd have something to share with him that has a need. Don't be the new guy. Be a solid part of the crew. And maybe be a lead crew. Maybe be on a lead crew. You know, the Germans would cruise around because there were thousands of bombers in the air. These German pilots who were just sharp as can be. And they'd fly around and they would look for a sloppy outfit because these bombers went in flights of 36 ships. And if he went into a tight, tight formation and tried to shoot through there with his single engine fighter, he'd have 36 guns trained on him, some of them doubles. Dependent, it didn't matter which way he came at it, he'd have 36 guns firing at him. And he, him with only his guns. So it was a bad disadvantage coming into a tight formation. But they'd fly around and they'd look for somebody that woke up drunk. They'd fly around and look for somebody that didn't have the nerve, that was tired and couldn't keep their formation tight and their game tight. And that's the formation and they just zip through it with their cannons blazing. Ba -ba 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 Boom! That's how ships go down. So, okay, it's 2019. Just pretend it's all peace and safety and the war won't touch you and your generation and that the Bible is a book about something other than wars. Let me tell you, just quit. Just quit seeing Jesus on the donkey, okay? He's coming back on a war horse. He's the Lion of Judah. He is the war lion. Get ready for that and get ready to be part of the solution and part of the team. This is Pastor Sam with your verse of the day for Gospel Gunslingers.